So if you were to see a messenger or a prophet, they're all beautiful human beings. They are spectacular human beings. They are charismatic human beings. <clears throat> and there is nothing in them that would naturally detract from following them. This is God's mercy, so that when you see the prophet or the messenger of God, then you are inclined to believe him. You are inclined to follow him. And that also means that for us as representatives and heirs of the messengers and the prophets, it's very important for us to present ourselves and to live in a way that is fair and just and merciful and kind. And one of the greatest sins that Muslims can do, which many Muslims do today, is to behave in such a way out of ignorance and injustice and lack of mercy so that people are repelled by them. And in this case, then you are making people feel repulsion towards the messengers themselves. And this is a great sin. So we are the heirs of the prophets and the messengers, and therefore we have the responsibility also uh, to lead good lives and to be fair and just and to be helpful, to be the middle nation, the moderate nation, and to bear witness over mankind, to be the judges between people. And uh, this is the way Muslims are when they take this inheritance and they, they imbibe it. But this inheritance comes through tradition. And we believe in the miracles of the prophets, which we'll come back to talk, to, to talk about more later. We believe that all prophets have the same message. They have one universal message, which uh, is repeated as, need, as needed because of the fact that people get it and they distort it. This is the history of the antagonism between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. One of the most effective ways to harm people is to alter the prophetic teaching that was given them. So always this is renewed by new prophets and new messengers. They have the same teaching, the primordial teaching. And as we said this morning, in the definition of prophets and messengers for us, they are not just people who receive inspiration from God or knowledge of the future, but they are men who receive the law and who are required to deliver the law. And there are women who receive the word of God, who receive inspiration and uh, who do great things. They are perfect women in history, like uh, Mary and like Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh, and Fatima and Khadija and Aisha and so forth. But they are not given the law and commanded to teach the law to the, to the people. Um, so they have one message and this has to be restored. And inshallah, we will talk about that more. Uh, today, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. So let's go back to uh, a, giving an account of the 25 messengers that are mentioned in the Qur'an. And we talked this morning about, we sort of, we're trying to take them in chronological order. So you have Adam, and you have Idris, Enoch, and you have Nur, Noah. These are before the flood. We talked about that this morning. And we are all the descendants of these prophets. Every one of us descends from Nuh and from Idris and from Adam and also from the third son of Adam who is Seth or Seth. And then after that you have Hud who was sent to Ad. And then you have Salih who was sent to Thamud. And we talked about Thamud. Thamud are an ancient people and they... Um, have an alphabet that they wrote with. They have inscriptions that are very common in the Arabian desert, especially in Hejaz, and we talked about that. And that alphabet is probably the origin of the Latin alphabet, the Greek alphabet, the Ethiopic alphabet, and even the Arabic alphabet. <clears throat> um, then we talked about Ibrahim, Abraham. When we come to Abraham, then we can begin to 
put down dates that are fairly, that are rough, but they're somewhat accurate. So Abraham lived about 4,000 years ago. The prophet Abraham uh, lived about 2,000 uh, BCE, before the Common Era. Then he has his son Ismail, Ishmael, who is also a prophet. And Ishmael is sent to the people of Jurhum, and he's also sent to the other tribes of the Yemen. These are called the pure Arabs. Ismail himself, who will have then his own line of children, they are called Arabized Arabs, Al Arab al Musta'ariba. And Ismail also is sent to call the Amalekites to the religion of God. And the Amalekites were Amalika, they were giants, they were big people. Abraham is the one who discovers where the house was, which is also where Noah was buried. This is a, stamp, this is a common Islamic tradition. It's not a very strong tradition, but it's there. And Abraham and Ishmael, as you know, they rebuild the Kaaba. And they institute the pilgrimage. So the pilgrimage had been there since the time of Adam or before. But it is also interrupted. And then with Abraham, it is renewed. The house is renewed and the rites of pilgrimage are given again. And the children of Ismail are entrusted with uh, protection of the pilgrimage and they did this quite faithfully for over for for thousands of years they preserved the pilgrimage and abraham also institutes the sacred months the sacred months are what months dhul qi'ada dhul hijjah and muharram so they are the uh, 11th and the 12th months of the lunar year Dhul Qa'da and Dhul Hijjah, this is the time when we make pilgrimage, and then Al Muharram, the forbidden month, which is the first month of the year. These three months come together in, in order that all of the tribes of Arabia and other people around could come to the pilgrimage. And it was forbidden to fight in those months. And by and large, the children of Ismail preserved that legacy very faithfully. They didn't fight in the sacred months. Then there was also a fourth sacred month, which is Rajab, <clears throat> the seventh month, right? Or the, yeah, the seventh month, right? And Rajab is a month where you can make Umrah, you can make lesser pilgrimage. And the children of Ismail held to the religion of Abraham with great tenacity and with great fidelity. And for thousands of years, there were links between the children of Ismail and between the children of Isaac in particular. The children of Ismail also inherit the secrets of the religion. And the children of Isaac and Jacob would come to visit them for a long time. For centuries and centuries, this was the case. Isaac, who is the other brother, who is the, one of the brothers of Ishmael, they have other brothers as well. Um, he is the descendant of Abraham and Sarah, and he is also a prophet. And Isaac, according to our scholars, was a prophet sent to the people of Canaan. The people of Canaan are the people who lived in what is today Palestine and uh, Lebanon and parts of Syria. And the children of Isaac were entrusted with the law. So they have to teach the law, the Sharia, and they have to practice it. And they also are charged to do jihad. But in this case, it is like war, holy war. It's not just moral struggle. And their jihad was against idolatry. And this was a major um, obligation that was put on the children of Jacob, the children of, of, of Israel. <clears throat> uh, Yaqub, who is the son of Isaac, Jacob, um, he is sent to the people of Canaan as well. And then after that comes Joseph, Yusuf, who is the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. And Joseph, as you know, is taken to Egypt. He is sent to the Egyptians, and he's also sent to the children of Israel. And um, there are indications in Pharaonic Egypt of 
the Joseph figure. You can, if you study about the pharaohs, you can, you can see that. So Yusuf is there in Pharaonic Egypt, and then in his time, the children of Israel are brought into Egypt, and they're brought there under a people who are called in history the Hyksos. The Hyksos, H-Y-K-S-O-S. These are a Semitic people who conquered Egypt, and their name was Hipshash, which means uh, shepherd kings, Bedouin kings. They were a desert people, and in fact, they welcomed people like the children of Israel into Egypt. And it's interesting, in this surah of Yusuf, in the, the surah in the Quran about Joseph, that it never refers to the king as Pharaoh. It always refers to him as the king, which is very accurate, because he was not a traditional Egyptian Pharaoh. Then as the generations go by, the children of Israel multiply in Egypt. They become hundreds of thousands, and then they are enslaved by the pharaohs when they get power back from the Hyksos. Uh, after Yusuf, we have then um, Shu'aib, who is in the Bible generally believed to be the prophet Jethro. Yethru, Yethru, Jethro. And Shu'aib is uh, sent to the people of Median. And Median, Median are descendants of Abraham. So he's sent to them, and Median is destroyed because they don't believe. Shu'aib marries one of his daughters to Moses, and Moses meets with him in the desert when he's wandering in the desert. <clears throat> uh, then you have Musa, Moses, who is sent to the Egyptians, and he's also sent to the children of Israel. And you have then also with him his brother Harun, Aaron, who is his older brother. Then the next prophet that we have in chronological order is David, Dawood. Dawood. And David is roughly around 1000 BCE. So between Abraham and between David is about a thousand years. It's about a millennium. And David is a great king, but he's also a prophet. The Jews and the Christians differ on David and Solomon. Were they kings or were they also kings and prophets? We believe that they were prophets and kings. And again, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we'll talk about a little bit today, <clears throat> these amazing documents, they affirm unequivocally that David and Solomon were prophets and kings and that they received revelation. David is one of the prophets who receives books. Most of the prophets and most of the messengers did not receive books. But Abraham receives ten books. In the Bible that we have today, we have no indication of that, at least none that I know of. But again, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's very clear that some of the texts that they have are scrolls of Abraham. So Abraham also had books. Moses is said to have been given ten books. And then he was given after that the Torah, the law. Um, David was given the Psalms. As we said before, the Psalms of David in the Bible as it exists today are 150. And biblical scholars doubt that half of them are authentically attributed to David. But the Dead Sea Scrolls are very clear that the psalms that were given to David were 4,050 psalms. So that means that the vast majority of them were lost. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are really clear about that, that the books were not protected. And the uh, righteous teachers of the Dead Sea Scroll community hold it as their primary obligation to protect the authentic legacy of the revelation of Moses. And for this reason, to enter the Dead Sea Scrolls community, you had to be tested. You had to be tested for at least three years. You had to prove that you were upright. You had to prove that you could keep secrets. And then they would let you in. And when they let you in, you would bring down blessings upon the children of Israel who obey and curse the children of Israel who disobey. This is very common in the history of the children of Israel. And then you are 
let into the community to receive the knowledge of the law of Moses. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's very clear that they believe that if they were to um, teach their teaching openly, that they would be opposed by the rabbis and the Jews, and especially the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and that they would be killed. This is a message that is given very clearly in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So they have their own community, they have their fortresses, and they protect the law. And one of the things that is very clear in the Dead Sea Scrolls is that this community believed that the coming of the Messiah was at hand. And they are living in Qumran by the Dead Sea uh, around about 70 BCE, which is about 70 years before Jesus. So they believe that the Messiah is about to come. And they are awaiting him. Very, very interesting. And then they believe that after him will come the great prophet of the end of days. The super prophet. And this is the Deuteronomy prophet of Deuteronomy 18. Whom we'll talk about a little bit in a moment. Who is our prophet. That God will send to you a prophet like me, Moses, and him you must obey. They believe in the Messiah, whom they hope to receive soon, and then they receive in the great prophet of the end of days, who will come after him. Uh, so David then has over 4,050 psalms, and the Dead Sea Scrolls even tells us about how they're organized, and that they end, for example, with two psalms that are for ta'wiz, that are for protecting ourselves from evil and from Satan and so forth, just as the Qur'an ends with the Surah Al-Falaq wa nas al-Mu'awwidhatayn. Solomon then comes after David. Again, in our tradition, he is a prophet and he is infallible. This is something that the Jews and the rabbis differed on. Some of them have a high opinion of Solomon, some of them don't. The Qur'an talks about that. Then you have Ayyub, Job who is Job in the Bible. And Ayub is a descendant of Esau. Esau is the brother of Jacob. And he is a prophet that doesn't belong to the children of Israel, although he's very close to them. And our scholars say that he was sent to the Romeans, that he was sent to the Romeans. Um, yeah, the Romeans. Who are the Romeans? Uh, the Romeans would be the Rum. So these are people like the Anatolians, the Hittites, the Indo-Europeans. Uh, then after that you have Dhul Kifl. Dhul Kifl and Dhul Kifl is the son of Job. And his mother is a descendant of Joseph. So he has in him the line of the children of Israel through Joseph, and he also has the line of Esau through his father, Job. And uh, it is said that Dhul Kifl is the one who took in many prophets of Israel and protected their lives when they were being persecuted. Um, then after that, we have uh, Yunus who is called Yuna, Yona in the Bible, Jonas. And Yunus was sent to the Assyrians. The Assyrians are a very powerful people <clears throat> who lived in the north of Babylonia. And their capital was Nineveh, which is not far from Mosul today. And <clears throat> Yunus is sent to them, so he's sent outside of the children of Israel. And... Um, he calls them to believe in the one God. They reject him. This is our story. And then he shows anger. He is muhadib. In other words, he feigns anger and he leaves. And then he's swallowed, swallowed by the whale. We believe in this story. One of the things that's very interesting is that the Assyrians, who were a powerful nation in the ancient world, they adopt in their history... <clears throat> the cult of Ashur. Ashur is their great god. And the cult of Ashur <clears throat> is the most monotheistic 
um, cult of all Babylonian religion. So again, this is something that's really worthy of study because we believe that the Assyrians believed in Yunus, that ultimately they followed him. And indeed, their cult of Ashur is a very monotheistic cult. And associated with Ashur, instead of having other deities, which was very common uh, for the Babylonians, they have names of God. So they have Ashur, and then what would have been the names of other gods, these become the names of God himself. Like Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, and so forth. So this is really interesting, and this is a historical indication of the prophecy of Yunus. Um, then we have, after that, uh, Ilyas, who is Elijah. <clears throat> And then he has a prophet who inherits from him, uh, who's called el And he's called in the Bible, Elisha. So you have Elijah and you have Elisha in the Bible. And we have Ilyas and el And both of them are powerful prophets <clears throat> from the children of Israel who are sent uh, against the Phoenicians and against the cult of Baal. And Baal is a, a, a man-made god. He is a lord that was created by the Venetians. And Elijah opposes the cult of Baal. And this is a very interesting story. We have it in the, in the Bible. And we have it also in the Quran. Uh, then after that you have uh, the 22nd of these prophets who is Zechariah, Zacharias in the Bible. <clears throat> and then Yahya, John the Baptist. And then you have number 24, Isa, Jesus, the Messiah. And these three come together at the end of the history of the children, of, of the prophetic history of the children of Israel. And their message is linked together. And um, <clears throat> they uh, deliver the message to the children of Israel. The other people in the Qur'an, like uh, Uzair, Ezra, uh, Luqman, uh, Dhul Qarnayn, who are also mentioned, <clears throat> they are generally believed not to be prophets. And uh, here, you know, our position is that we do not believe or declare, we do not declare anyone to be a prophet or a messenger unless that is conclusively known. So here we come back to a principle which is very important in our religion, and that is that in creedal matters, the only things that you can make issues of creed are things that are absolutely clear in the revealed sources that we have. So these 25 we know are messengers, and we believe in that. But uh, others, like Al-Khidr, for example, who is referred to in the Qur'an, the one that Moses goes to with Joshua, and they learn from him. Um, some say he's a wali, some say he's a prophet, some say that he's a messenger. But we don't take a definitive position on that, because we don't know. And this is also true of other great people in history who may well have been prophets. So you have people like Zoroaster, Zardusht. Zoroaster was an ancient Persian prophet. And he's an amazing person. Um, he taught a religion that was apparently pure Tawheed, pure monotheism. And he was from the west of Iran, uh, he was then persecuted. He then goes to the east of Iran, where he's to what is today Afghanistan. There he's taken in by a great king, and he also does jihad. He also fights, you know, uh, you know, for he fights against his enemies to establish the oneness of God. He believes in one God. He believes in heaven and hell. He believes in the tr the traverse, the sirat that is over uh, the fire. It's very, very interesting. Of all of the religions that we know about in the ancient world, 
Zoroaster's religion seems to be the closest to the religion of Abraham. But again, was he a prophet or was he not a prophet? Um, you can have a good opinion of him. And if you like, you can even believe in your heart of hearts that he was a prophet. But that can't be dogma. That can't be our creed. <clears throat> because we don't know for sure. Uh, also, figures like Buddha. <clears throat> Uh, Lao Tzu in China, who's an amazing figure, Confucius and Socrates, or whoever it may be, these people, it's very useful to study about them. It's very useful also to study about their history. But we don't put them in the line of the prophets because we don't know for sure. Again, the nature of religion in human history is the corruption of the message. This is why prophets are sent again and again. And... Uh, you know, so we can study these people with that kind of a background. But they're very, very interesting things in, in their legacy. As I mentioned before, Socrates, for example, who is one of the most important figures, one of the pivotal figures in the West. Uh, Socrates talks about God. Socrates opposed the uh, deities of Athens. Uh, Socrates, when asked about God, he said that one of the most essential attributes of God is to be utterly without need. And Socrates is then condemned to death by the oligarchy of Athens because of the fact that he will not cease to attack the gods and he will not cease to teach wisdom. And Socrates says, men of Athens, after they condemn him to death, they say that if you don't stop what you're doing, you will be put to death. And he says, men of Athens, I honor and love you, but I shall obey God rather than you. <clears throat> as long as I have life and strength, I will not cease the practice and teaching of the love of wisdom. Why do you care about money, honor, and reputation, and care so little about wisdom truth and the uh, greatest improvement of your soul these are really really interesting stories and it's very important for us to study this uh, in the best way that we possibly can we believe that jesus uh, came at the end of the history of the children of israel he is the messiah the messiah is a powerful figure in uh, rabbinic teaching uh, he is a deliverer and uh, Jesus comes also to tell of the prophet of the end of days. Um, and this is in the Bible. We won't talk about it very much, but it's something really worthy of study. Uh, in Genesis, for example, in Genesis 49, 1 and 10, um, it says, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather together. And then he said, um, Gather yourselves together so that I can tell you what will happen to you in the last days. And then he tells many things. This is what will happen to this tribe. This is what will happen to the other tribe. Then he says the scepter, which is like the power to rule, will not depart from Judah, which is a tribe. And it's the tribe of David. Nor a lawgiver. Again, you always have a prophet who is giving the law from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Shiluh. Shiluh means messenger, until the messenger comes. And unto him shall be the gathering of the people. So Shiloh is a really interesting figure. And there are many things like this in the Bible. You have many references uh, to this. Then in Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 18, uh, you have the Deuteronomy prophet. And this is the prophet that Moses announces to the children of Israel, and he says that God will send to you a prophet who will be like me, and him you must obey. And he will not speak of himself, but he will speak what God reveals to him. And whoever does not follow him will be taken to task. And this is repeated again in the Acts of the Apostles. And again, as, I, as we said, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, this Deuteronomy prophet, whom we believe to be our prophet, 
You know, he is the major belief of the Dead Sea Scroll community. And they have descriptions of him. They have revelations about him. And they are awaiting his coming. In the case of Jesus, peace be upon him, in the book of John, the chapter 16, in chapter 16, you have uh, the paraclete who is referred to. <clears throat> so Jesus talks about, he says that it is difficult for me, for you that I leave you, because he's only with his disciples for a very short time. He says, but I must go away, because if I do not go away, the paraclete won't come. And when the paraclete comes, he will guide you into all truth, and he will tell you the truth about me. The paraclete is referred to in John um, four times, and then also six times he's referred to as the spirit of truth. So this is really, really interesting. And again, uh, the paraclete is a human being. He's referred to in the Greek of the Bible as a ho parakletos, the paraclete. This is only used for a man. If he were the Holy Spirit, you know, which is a standard Christian interpretation of the paraclete, then it would have to be to parakleton. It would have to be in the neuter because the Holy Spirit is always in the neuter. So most Christians, when they talk about that, they will say this is very ambiguous. Many of them say this is definitely a human being. He is a human being who will come. He will teach. He will preach. He will defend Jesus. He will teach the truth about Jesus. And uh, this is his mission. Okay, and then, of course, we have the last of the prophets who is the prophet, the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, one of the things that we believe in conclusion about the prophets is that they were infallible. And they are trustworthy. They are truthful. They fully deliver the message. They are people of the keenest intelligence. They do what is right. They are perfect examples for human beings. Anything that contradicts that, um, you know, we do not accept as authentic. And um, all of the prophets, Lot, Noah, Jacob, whoever they were, they were upright, perfect human beings who walked in the way of God and who did what was right and uh, who set examples for all times to come. One of the issues about infallibility is that you have certain prophets and messengers who do things that seem to be contradictory to that. So Adam is commanded not to eat of the tree. And he eats of the tree. And this is called in the Quran disobedience, that Adam disobeyed. If you remember from the text that Shaykh Hamza is teaching, about maharim al lisan, the things that are forget, forbidden on the tongue. He says in that poem that you may not say of Adam that he disobeyed except in quoting that verse. In other words, we don't make a point of that, that Adam disobeyed. Uh, also, in the case of uh, Yunus, he leaves the city of Nineveh before he's given permission and he is angry. And in the case of Job, he gets very sick and he loses all of his wealth and he goes and he sits outside the city. And in the case of Jacob, his eyes become um, pure blind because of his sadness over Joseph until the robe of Joseph com comes back to him. And there are a number of things like that in the lives of the messengers and the prophets. And as you know, uh, these verses have to be interpreted or understood in a way that does not contradict the basic fundamentals that we believe about God, that God is unlike anything in creation. He is the Lord of space and time. So he is not a body. He is not in time. He's not in space. And these verses have great meaning, but they've got to be understood in such a way that they don't violate the foundations of the faith. This is really important. We've talked about that a lot. And also, if you recall, when we talked about the eight roots of disbelief, one of those roots of disbelief was to take resemblant verses literally. These verses that we just talked about. So to take them literally, 
<clears throat> and to believe that God is actually a body, that he's anthropomorphic, that he's like us, that this is a root of disbelief. So we don't do that. In the case of the prophets, we have something which is similar here. And that is that there are stories in the Qur'an itself in which uh, things happen with the prophets or things are narrated about them which don't appear uh, you know, to be in harmony with the infallibility of the prophets. So here we have to take a position which is courteous and which is not strictly literal. So in the case of Adam, for example, and all these other cases, it's said that these are sirdul qadr. These belong to the secret of destiny. And in the case of Adam, that although God commands him not to eat of the tree, that in fact, inwardly, he is commanded to do so. So outwardly, he's commanded not to do that, but inwardly, he's commanded to do so. And in this, then, the human drama begins. And the human beings are then tested. They fall to the earth. History begins as we know it. And our scholars say that although Adam ate of the tree, he committed no minor or major sin. He was not sinful. The Quran never says that he was sinful. He was given this command and he did not follow that command. So this is the adab. This is the courtesy that we have towards that. And this is a way of understanding also that you have the literal meaning, which we affirm, but then you have deeper meanings that are below that. Uh, one of the great sheikhs, the Sheikh al-Akbar, he said that had I been Adam, I would have eaten the tree. And that's because of the fact that by this, then human history unfolds. And it has in it all of the realities that bring to bear the greatness of the prophets and the greatness of the messengers and the unfolding of human history. So this is a secret of destiny. And this is what we believe also about uh, the, these other aspects um, of the prophets' lives. But in all of these things, they are examples for us. So in the case of Ayyub, alayhi salam, you have a prophet who is afflicted in the most complete and horrible way. He loses his family, his wealth, everything. So in this, there's a great lesson, and it comes conjoined with the story of Solomon, who is the prophet who is given everything. So this is an example. And then also you have the example of Job as well. In the case of Adam, uh, so we do not believe in original sin. And uh, original sin is a very interesting concept because of the fact that, um, first of all, most Christians don't believe in original sin. Uh, the Eastern Church never believed in original sin. The doctrine of original sin is purely a Pauline doctrine. It, it, it is associated with Paul, even though whether Paul actually held it or not is a debate. But the person who um, insists upon original sin as church doctrine is Augustine. And Augustine uh, is often said to be the father of the Western church, the Catholic church, the Roman Catholic church, and most of the Protestant churches are Augustinian. Augustine's a very important figure, but he is the one who insists that original sin must be church doctrine.